Hey everybody. Today we're talking about correlation testing. I'm going to be working in R as usual, but pretty much everything I'm going to say is universal, so if you're working on a different environment, stick around. I'm going to be looking at the college data set as an example here. That's found in the ISLR2 package, which I've already loaded up. I've also loaded up Tidyverse, of course, and set my theme to minimal. I get a little tired of ggplot's default gray background. I have a whole video analyzing the college data set. I'll throw a link to that up top if you're more interested in it, um, if you're interested in learning more. It, is con it consists of 777 observations. Each one is a college back in 1995. We've got a lot of different variables here, including whether or not the college is public or private, what the full-time undergraduate enrollment is, and what the graduation rate is. I'm going to be interested in this question. There is a correlation in this set between the logarithm of full-time undergraduate enrollment population and graduation rate at public universities. I'd like to know if that's statistically significant. In other words, is it reasonable to suggest that this relation, apparent relationship is just due to random chance? Or um, is it likely that this is um, an actual trend in the data that we might want to pay attention to? So I've already pulled up a ggplot of this relationship. Graduation rate on the y-axis and the logarithm of the full-time undergraduate enrollment on the x-axis. Here in line 12 you'll see I've done a filter to take out all of the private schools to stick only with the um, colleges that are not listed as private. Okay, so um, first of all don't be intimidated by the logarithm in here. The logarithm is just saying look at the scale here. And a base 10 logarithm in particular is telling you how many zeros are at the end of your number. So 3.0 on a logarithmic scale is 10 to the third, 1,000. 4.0 is 10 to the fourth on a logarithmic scale, or 10,000. And what we saw in the data analysis of the college data set was that it's really the scale of the college that matters more than the specific number that is being enrolled at that college. A second um, point in favor of using a log logarithmic scale here is that there are a lot more small colleges than big colleges, so the explanatory variable here is really crunched in towards the smaller numbers. And by taking a logarithm, any sort of logarithm really, um, we get a much more um, even spread, more of a normal distribution in our explanatory variable. Long story short, once we take the logarithm here of the full-time undergraduate enrollment, we have a generally linear relationship between these two variables with a really nice spread both in the x and y direction. So correlation is going to be justified. Remember, correlation de describes the strength of a generally linear relationship between a couple of quantitative variables. So let's get it. In the public data set, I want grad rate. And also in the public data set, I want the full-time undergraduate enrollment. And in particular, I want the base 10 logarithm of that. So let's go ahead and compute that. About 0.22. So it's a positive correlation, indicating that as the x value gets bigger, the y value tends to get bigger as well. That's potentially surprising, that it, as the colleges get bigger, they tend to have higher graduation rates. and. Um, we are welcome to speculate about why that might be the case. The um, correlation is fairly weak, however. Um, remember, correlations run from negative 1 to 1 only, with a negative 1 being a perfect negative correlation and a positive 1 being a perfect positive correlation. Okay, so let's actually answer this question. Is it reasonable to believe that this number is just due to random chance and that these two quantitative variables are actually uncorrelated? So in R, the syntax to run a correlation test is actually really similar to the syntax to just compute correlation. So let's get that. And I'll align this properly, otherwise it's going to bother me. Core.test, and then the two variables in question. Again, order doesn't matter. When I execute that command, I will get the correlation again, as well as some other information. By the way, in each of these two cases, R is defaulting to Pearson correlation, 
That's what I'm talking about throughout this vid. It's the standard correlation that you'll talk about, for instance, in other undergraduate statistics classes. Um, there are other methods available to you. For instance, Spearman's is another one that gets used a lot. Um, I'm just not going to talk about it in this vid. In particular, we see a p-value of 0 0.001. That's saying that if, in fact, a null hypothesis were true, and these two variables were truly uncorrelated overall in a larger population, we would get sample data with this kind of correlation, or one more extreme, just by random chance, about a tenth of a percent of the time. So that's a pretty infrequent occurrence. Um, so infrequent, in fact, that we don't consider it to be a reasonable hypothesis. We instead conclude that there is a correlation between these two variables. Okay, um, let's get a little bit underneath the hood here. I don't want to go too deep into the math, but I want to make sure that we all have a better understanding of what this is actually doing. So, um, as I've said a couple of times, we're checking whether an observed correlation in sample data could reasonably be attributed to random chance. And of course, it's applicable when you're considering two quantitative variables, so um, lists of numbers, with a generally linear relationship. And um, it's that assumption right there that caused me, um, really required me to start with this plot, with this GG plot that I did, showing that there's a generally linear relationship between those variables. The assumptions and limitations of a correlation test are very similar to those of linear regression. The most important assumption besides linearity is that the observations should be independent from one another. So in particular, you want to steer away from this test if you've got um, time series data. Technically, the correlation test is assuming that the data is coming from a bivariate normal distribution. Um, in practice, as long as the data isn't too radically skewed and the sample size is reasonable, you should be good to go. The other assumptions are a lot more important here. I want to draw your attention to this last bullet point, to this warning. This test is only valid for the null hypothesis that the population correlation is identically zero, and so it can't be used to test other hypothesized values of that population correlation. So for instance, in the present case, if we wanted to, um, we're, we're, we tested whether or not the population correlation could reasonably be zero, um, reasonably be claimed to be zero, we could not test whether it could reasonably claim to be 0.2. So without going through the math in depth, I do want to mention the test statistic that's being used here. It's this, r over the square root of 1 minus r squared times the square root of n minus 2, where r is the observed sample correlation and n is the sample size. So the formula isn't too bad. The derivation of it is, I spent a little time looking at that as I was preparing for this and decided uh, not to present it. You're welcome. Assuming the null hypothesis is true and the population correlation is actually zero, then this test statistic is going to have a student's t distribution with n minus 2 degrees of freedom. So that's a distribution that we understand pretty well if we're doing this kind of math. For instance, in the present case, we have 212 observations and the observed correlation between our variables was about 0.22. If you plug that into the formula um, up here, you get t equals 3.3, which is about the same as what we got in our um, core dot test. It's not identical for two reasons. One is rounding. The second is that R is doing slightly more sophisticated math underneath the hood here. I'm also not going to get into that. If you wanted to, you could compute the p-value by hand by taking the probability of randomly getting a t-value um, whose absolute value is greater than 3.3 just by random chance um, in that t-distribution with 210 degrees of freedom. In R, you do that with the pt command. I have a whole video on t-calculations in R. I'll throw a link to that up top. The next thing that I want to point out is that this... Um, p-value that we're going to get here is actually exactly the same as what we would get if we did a regression model. And there's math reasons behind that that I won't go too deeply into. Let's actually get the linear regression model here. So lm, I want to know how grad dot rate is related to log 10 of, undergr of f undergrad 
and the data should be, let me start a new line so that it doesn't run off the edge here, should be public. And then let's get the summary of that model. Okay, lots of information here. Um, I won't go into it in depth, but notice the p-value here for the slope is 0 0.00116, which is up to rounding the same as the p-value that we got here. So that's testing a null hypothesis that the slope of this line, of this regression line, is actually zero. And if you look at the formula for the regression line, for the slope of the regression line, it's something like r standard deviation of y divided by the standard deviation of the observed x values. So it's just a scaled value, scaled um, sample correlation. So it stands to reason that the p-values testing that each of the two are zero would be the same. Looking at the ANOVA stuff down here, you can see that that p-value is also the same and the math backs that up as well. That will always be the case. I want to show you one more kind of cool thing here. Um, I won't go into the math in depth, but it's worth seeing a tiny bit of it because there's a really nice simple shortcut for estimating when a given sample correlation might be considered statistically significant. So you've gone out, you've got a couple, you've got some data on two variables, computed the correlation, you know the sample size, just at a glance. You'd like to be able to tell if it might be statistically significant or not. So at your most typical level of statistical significance, alpha equals 0.05, the critical t value for statistical significance is going to be about 2. It'll be bigger for small samples, and for larger ones it might be even a little bit smaller. But for most samples, um, a critical t of 2 is a really good estimate. And so all I'm going to do is plug that into the last formula and say, I'm going to have statistics, statistical significance whenever I get a t-value greater than or equal to 2. So just setting the right-hand side greater than or equal to 2. Now I'm just going to solve it for r. And I'll do this really fast because the algebra isn't so interesting. Multiply both sides by the denominator and square it. Reorganize that a tiny bit. Solve for r squared and take a square root. And you get this. The absolute value of r greater than or equal to 2 over the square root of n plus 2. Now, if you've got a reasonable size sample, which hopefully you do if you have any kind of, if you're doing any kind of statistical inference, it's reasonable to replace n plus 2 with n. And that gives you the super simple um, cutoff, critical cutoff for the sample correlation being statistically significant. It's just 2 over the square root of n. And that's something you can almost do in your head. For instance, as in the, in the present example, we had a sample size of 212, so the critical cutoff for the correlation was plus or minus 0.14. Let's go back as we wrap this up and look at our correlation that we actually got. It was 0.22, so bigger than that, statistically significant, but not enormously bigger than that, just, uh, just a little bit, and that uh, kind of explains why our p-value is lower than any reasonable cutoff, like 0.05, but also not infinitesimal.